Thank you very much, Alenka. Um, well, <clears throat> let me start with an old saying, which has it that a problem shared is a problem halved. Now you think about that, and I suppose if you unpack it, you could imagine that in times of crisis, we naturally sort of hunker down and try and internalize and work out how to deal with something. But it's curious, if you do have a problem, how often sharing it, other people can help with it, they want to help with it, you get great human nature, particularly at a time like this. And so sharing your problem can really help you deal with it. And that is basically the root of crisis communications. And at this point in our history, this dreadful time of coronavirus, how communicator can help you get through it. And that's what I'm gonna share with you over the next half an hour or so. And thank you for the, um, the intro, Lenka. Um, expert, well, I'll let you judge about that. But um, my credentials, I have my own media and public relations agency, Creative Warehouse. I teach communications at the University of Cambridge and in government departments. I'm also an author. I've had a few novels published, done other bits and bobs. And I was a BBC News correspondent for 20 years. So those are my credentials for talking to you today. Uh, so crisis communications, because um, I'm a fairly simple creature, I've broken it down to thinking about it like this. Let me introduce you to the ABC of crisis communications. And A is anticipation. Now you may be thinking anticipation, it's already happened with coronavirus, but actually it's generally thought things are going to get worse still. Oh dear, sorry to say that and depress your Wednesday, but there are worse things to come. And that means worse for us as businesses, companies and organizations. So the best thing you can do is to be ahead of the curve and try and anticipate what may be coming at you next. So you're in a stronger position to deal with it. So the first interaction I'd like to do with you today is just to try and list a bit of a coronavirus chaos catalog. You've already been whacked around by the virus, we all have, but what could happen next? How could life get worse for you, your company, your business, your organization? So try and predict three, four, five, the top five things which could cause a really bad impact on your company, your organization, maybe you as a sole trader, I know many of you are, what could happen next which would really make things worse? So let's just do that for a couple of minutes as our first interaction. And then Lenka will see some of your thoughts coming up on the screen. She'll share them with me. We'll make a list because a lot of this is helping each other. We'll be able to get ideas like, oh, I hadn't thought of that, really good point. I'll be ready for that as well. So just have a couple of minutes to think about that. And then when you've thought about three, four, five big issues that coronavirus could cause you next, type them in, Lenka will read them out, and then we'll have a look at some of them. Fantastic. And in the meantime, I just want to say hello to everyone who's joining us. We have about 17 people watching live. We have Pamela, we have Prisha, we have Ella, we have Sylvie, we have Charlie. We have a lovely bunch of people joining us today. So thank you so much for your comments. Hi Lenka, thank you for arranging this. So thank you Simon for saying yes to my question to do this. So please leave your comments under the live video. I can keep checking uh, and let us know what kind of coronavirus chaos catalog you can build for your own company. Uh, in my own um, business, I started thinking about it in terms of obviously it's the clients. That's the first thing that you start worrying about it. How do I help them? How do I make sure that they are um, aware and that they know what to do and how can I help them? But also making sure that some of them might have to close down their business and pause their business and stuff like that. So obviously how that will affect my income and how it will uh, affect my livelihood and stuff like that. And if it's a couple of clients, if it's all my clients, if it's how my services are currently being delivered, if I need to change my business model in terms of how this works. So there were some of the top things that I started thinking in terms of my business. And what about yourself as well, Link? I mean, you are a sole trader, you work with other people, I know, but what about if something should happen to you? Yeah. So that's another question in terms of backup plan that I realize I don't have. Um, and it's something that I'm working on because yes, uh, my business is just me and I'm trading my time for money. So the moment I'm not able to deliver, there is absolutely no one else who is able to deliver. And I realize how unprepared I am in terms of any kind of processes and any kind of communication with my clients. Uh, so that's one of the things that I'm working on right now very quickly. It's putting together a processes because I know that there's lots of very helpful virtual assistants out there 
who, if I do have processes in place, who would be able fairly flexibly to jump in and help, even though I don't have them on contract just yet. But I know there are people out there who would be able to be easily plugged into the business, but they need to understand what they need to be doing. Good. And Good. we're getting Good. some responses for the people, so I will go and read it out. Ella says, other small businesses losing business, so I end up losing clients. Exactly my situation. Jemima says, if I get ill, my PC breaking beyond repair, not being able to go out and do photo shoots because she's a photographer. Uh, how do I help my clients? And five, how do I not fade into the background and keep visible? Very yeah. interesting points. Um, do you yeah. want to say something yeah. about that or shall I keep reading? No, no, that, that's good. That's good. Um, when you're dealing with a, a problem, as we all have at the moment, it really will help you to keep on top of it if you are anticipating what may come next. So what I suggest you do is when you have a minute, think about perhaps the top five things that could really happen, which could impact you. And as you were saying, Link, perhaps one of the most important is if you yourself were ill with coronavirus to the extent you can't really do much, what's going to happen then? How are you going to get business continuity? So business continuity planning, how do you keep in touch with your clients? How do you keep them on side, even if things are getting tough? So that's important. Good. So the first part of, um, of communications in a crisis is trying to be ahead of the game so anticipation the a anticipation it's really critical it may seem like wasted time and i know how precious our time is um, and how busy we can be but thinking about some of the things that could happen and then being ready for them then that is really important right i'm not going to do this as an interaction because it might take too long but i'm just going to give you five seconds to think about this question there's a lot of research which has been done on crisis communications how long do you think on average it takes a company or an organization to get a message out when something really bad has happened to that company or organization? How long does it take to get a competent, decent message out? Have a think about that. I bet many of you are thinking, ooh, hours, ooh, minutes, ooh, days, yeah? Actually, the research says it's about 20 hours on average, 20 hours for a company to get a good message out when something bad has happened, which is really bad for its reputation. Then contrast that with how fast does the modern media move, particularly in the social media age. So if you're waiting 20 hours to get your response out when something bad has happened, the problem has already run away from you. You aren't gonna get it back because there'll be so much out there on social media, so much gossip, so much talk, and on the mainstream media if they pick up on it as well. So that leads me to the next really important part of the A of crisis communications, holding statements. Now, Creative Warehouse is my company, and I like to think that I do something useful for it. I'm the director, I do business development, I basically do project management. Um, people who work with me might disagree. However, I think I do something useful there. So imagine, there's about 12 of us in the company. Imagine something happened to me as director, I was struck down by coronavirus and it was quite severe to the extent that I couldn't really do anything useful. There would be concern amongst our clients and we've got quite a few, word would spread, it could cause serious damage to the business, there could be a panic, I could be getting messages, I might not be able to deal with them, it'd be a very stressful situation because I wasn't ready for that particular eventuality. Holding statements, when you've got your top five things that might disrupt your business, Think about what you would put out in terms of information if these happened. Be ready, be ahead of the curve. So if some stuff starts to appear on social media, you've got something ready to go. And I'll give you some examples about how you do this. There are three steps to holding statements. The first one is empathy. Human beings are full of feelings and empathy is always the first stage in anything. When something bad has happened, you feel for the people involved. So if I was struck down, empathy, first stage, our thoughts are with Simon and his family and friends. Always start with empathy. You'll notice politicians on the news when something bad happens, they'll always talk about the people involved, the carers. For example, at the moment, NHS, wonderful people working really hard. Of course they are. Empathy is always your first point. But then you have to move on and you have to do something concrete and take some action. Action means taking responsibility. So the holding statement for this, for me, might be, there's a comprehensive list of Creative Warehouse clients and projects, a plan in place for continuity of service, and we, his 10 associates, will step in to cover. So hopefully, that will then reassure our customers that we are on top of it, 
everything isn't going to go horribly wrong because some of this stuff we're doing is against deadlines. They can still rely on us. Empathy first, action second. And thirdly, and this is really important because no end of companies are always being caught out by this and politicians too as well. Realism. Be honest and be transparent. It's no good trying to pull the wool over people's eyes and gloss over a problem because it'll come back to bite you. When you can't do what you say you're going to do in a few hours or a couple of days, they'll be saying, well, what's going on? What's going wrong? And then you lose trust and trust is precious. So in this case, if it was me struck down at Creative Warehouse, there are 57 projects of all stages of urgency and maturity. So it'll take several days to talk to all our clients individually regarding their specific needs. Three stages of holding statements. Empathy, always the feeling first. Action, take responsibility. Yes, we know coronavirus is affecting everyone and everything, but your bit you take responsibility for with your business. And then you go on to deal with it and you deal with it realistically, honestly and transparently. This is how long it will take. It's going to take five days. It's going to take five days. Be honest, real and transparent. Otherwise, you will just get caught out. So again, for a little interaction, just have a couple of minutes to think about, and I really hope I'm not fating myself talking about getting the thing or you either. Think about how your business would cope if you were struck down. If you're a sole trader, particularly, is there anyone you can rely on? You can put out these holding statements for you to help you. And what would the holding statement say? So just have a couple of minutes to think about an instance where, bless you, I really hope this doesn't happen, where you get the bug, it's pretty bad. What are you going to put out? Because your clients are thinking, well, what about my service? What about what they're helping me with? Just have a couple of minutes to think about that. And in the meantime, I will go back to some of the comments that we've got. And on your question, how long it usually takes for companies to get their ducks in a row, Ella said less than five minutes. So obviously. Oh, you'd be lucky. It takes eight. Hey, they're awful. <laughs> uh, and then she commented saying, only need to look how quickly news moved to Twitter which obviously Twitter is one of the newsworthy platforms where whenever something happens, we go to Twitter for the most relevant up-to-date news these days, be it for companies, be it for media, be it from other people. And yes, uh, Twitter moves very fast. The tweets go one after another. And the time expected uh, of companies to react is usually an hour. It's not uh, a day or two. So people need to be very flexible. Uh, so we are getting a couple of comments. Lillian says, how do you convince your bosses that empathy is important where they want to give a corporate blanket response? Empathy is absolutely critical. If you don't show empathy, you won't get anywhere in life. You've got to feel for people. You've actually, you know, if, if there isn't empathy, there isn't anything really, because we are humans and feeling creatures. So find some way to but to know how do you convince people if someone hasn't got empathy it's really hard to convince them to have it try i think we might have lost simon for a second so this will be interesting we'll see how the internet will go uh, i'll see if in comments if it's just me losing simon or if it's everyone losing simon um maybe hopefully he will reappear very soon um, and we can continue with our talk otherwise um yeah well uh, ella mentioned in one of her comments i think that what will happen if the internet goes down that we might see what will happen if the internet goes down um, i'll just go back to a couple of the comments that you shared before which i think were very interesting in terms of uh, what could happen to your business and what you could potentially start thinking about in the situation. And you said that you might get a slow in sales, that you might not be able to send out products. Uh, obviously, you might not be able to distribute as efficiently as before. You can't meet customer needs because you don't get the supplies, you don't get the staff. Um, you're not able to keep your staff on exactly. Uh, you might not be able to get products to sell, import and export. Um, there's lots of questions whether you should stop social media and focus on sales and whether you should stop having any fan posts, which are both really interesting points. Um, I think in terms of marketing, um, obviously you want to keep marketing, you want to keep focusing on some social media activity, making sure that uh, if you're able to sell at least something in a smaller scale on a different way, that you can still continue sale selling and marketing because if you don't sell, your business will not exist. So even in a crisis situation, 
one of the recommendations is always continue with your marketing, continue with your communication, continue with your sales. Obviously, make sure that it's appropriate, that it's relevant, that it's working the way it's supposed to be, that it's sensitive, that you follow the rules of empathy and being factual and being honest about stuff. But I would say always keep selling um, co risky marketing. In terms of uh, whether we should stop having any fun posts, that very much depends on your business brand, on your company brand. If your brand is fun and light and kind of not so serious, look for example at Innocent Drinks who are having so much fun with their marketing right now because it's their brand being fun and lighthearted, that's okay to continue. But if your business is usually very serious, very professional, very strict, it would feel very much out of character for you to start uh, being more fun and putting some very quirky jokes and try to be jokey. It would really feel not appropriate out of character. So there's a couple of your answers. Um, just quickly checking the comments and seeing what's happening with Simon because he seemed to disappear completely from this Facebook Live. I can't see him anywhere. I keep checking if I get a message from him somewhere on my phone or somewhere. If he lets me know what's happening, if his internet went down or what's going on. But other than that, um, we have comments from Charlie, who says one of my five clients this week uh, just canceled tomorrow because she has the bug. Everyone panicked. Yes, really sorry to hear that, especially in certain um, industries when you work one to one with clients, be it a private chef, be it a trainer, then really much you are so dependent on the people wanting to continue and obviously being able to do delivery online as well as uh, if there's someone of your clients who get infected because it might happen that if you're selling to them that they might not have the uh, interest of actually working with you and i can see that we have simon back which is great uh, i'm quite excited to see him hi simon hello again i have no idea what happened there was that me or you or was it everybody else too I think it was you because I managed to continue talking to the audience and they seem to be um, responding. So I made you host again and I can see your screen again. So we right. let's see if we can make this work again. Right, I'm so sorry everybody. <laughs> yes, so I'll quickly just check what's happening in terms of, um, we were asking people for a question. Could you please remind me the question? Yeah, we were talking about the holding statements and you being ready with a holding statement um, if something happened to you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we had a question um, from someone asking that uh, the new tech venture I had started deals in automation and disaster recovery and BCP automation. I feel a lot of organization could benefit, but most people don't seem to be in frame to discuss anything new. How to handle this kind of situation that you actually are in a position where you have something helpful in this situation, mm. but it's something new and how do you communicate that? Well, that's difficult because everybody is preoccupied with just keeping things going at the moment and unlikely to use any of their bandwidth to actually take on new stuff. So that's frustrating. I believe persistence is really important in life. Keep going. Um, if you knock at 100 doors, one of them will eventually open. I certainly found that in my life. And also, how are you communicating it? Um, have you got a good value proposition? Could you express, for example, the importance of what you do and why I should be interested in you in just, say, 10 words, mm -hmm. five seconds? That's really important. That's one of the first things I teach businesses when I'm at the University of Judge Business School. Can we get what you do down to something so interesting and so striking that in just 10 seconds, I will immediately be interested in it? Um, people have very, very limited attention spans, particularly at this time of crisis. So try and get them very quickly. Make it really good. Remember, put yourself in their shoes. Think, why would they be interested in this? And sum it up in just one little chunk. And that might help you. Yeah. So I think lots of the people in the comments I'm seeing are very unsure about what to say and how to communicate, what to post on social media. Uh, Zareen was help, very helpful in saying show evidence, how it impacts the bottom line. So talking about the new product or the new service or stuff, showing the proof. 
we're going to go on now to talk about a little bit more um, actually about how to put things um, which may help you in terms of how you structure. So if you think about holding statements, have them ready. Holding statements are basically building on your business continuity plan. Lenka, you're a naughty girl. So if you haven't got a business continuity plan, or if something happens to you, you better get one. So you need a friend or an associate who's gonna keep things ticking along. They obviously won't be able to do it in your inimitable style with such talent, but at least they can keep the business going for when you get back to it, okay? So think about your holding statements. Um, this is also really important. Audience, who are you talking to? first of all um so who are the key people you're going to be talking to if you have problems with coronavirus um so obviously you want to talk to your staff if you've got any staff are important ambassadors for you they'll go out and talk to other people about the company they really help the name but also customers customers are very important to talk to customers if you have as many people do uh, one or two key customers key clients then don't just email them pick up the phone they will appreciate it, they will give you time, okay? Sometimes the personal touch for the big ones is really, really important. And you'll have stakeholders as well, people who work with you, you might have shareholders, you might have investors, you might have people who run the office for you, whatever. Um, make sure you get a good categorical and comprehensive plan of everyone you need to talk to with your communications. It's very easy when a lot of bad stuff is happening to forget someone, to slip between the cracks. So have an idea, once you've got your, your idea of what could before you and you've got your holding statements your business continuity in place who are you going to be talking to the key people to talk to and also how are you going to talk to them um, you've got various channels open to you social media is obviously one to talk to more generally to the public but you've got email you can talk to your customers with you've got newsletters you've got your website as well don't forget that that can be quite important and um, uh, phone calls, video calls as well. For your big clients, I would certainly recommend talking to them in person because it's really important to keep them on site, okay? So that's the ABC. Um, that's the A of crisis communication. So let's go on to B, which I think might help you when you're asking about your new product um, and how it could help at this time. Um, B of the ABC is this fella, boom, when the crisis hits. And the key to this is this quote from Warren Buffett, the business guru, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. Absolutely true, absolutely true. So the key when problems hit you is fast, effective, clear communications, action, and then communicating it. So let's have a look about how you communicate, what the critical things to think about communicating when crisis strikes. And to do that, I'm going to introduce you to a case study. Um, Lenka kindly, when she send out the joining links, will also have sent you a little attachment as well. This is a classic case study of how to handle crises and how not to handle crises. This is Tesco versus BP. Tesco a few years ago, horse meat was found in their food. Uh, BP, uh, Gulf of Mexico oil spill, 11 men died in that. It was a dreadful pollution, a disaster, environmental disaster for a beautiful body of water. So on your handouts, just have a, a read about how Tesco handled their crisis and then how BP handled their crisis. Compare and contrast. And when you've read, start to type to link uh, some of the lessons you've learned from that about how to manage a crisis. So you can find this PDF in the group. I shared it just an hour before um, our live. So you can just go to the previous post and you will be able to set, find a PDF with a case study. Um, I'll just uh, share a comment that Krisha just shared, which says, I'm a holistic therapist and dependent on clients. I have set up Instagram and hope to help people through social media posts. I've had clients call me worrying about getting sick and worrying about not having an income, but under the current circumstances, I'm not charging. She's very kind that she's offering some support for free and just offering some consolation. Um, what is your view on this when people right now don't have any client work potentially or have less work on uh, helping others be it for free be volunteering be it in other ways well i think it's a great thing to do i think it's a great thing to do on two counts uh, first of all it's the right thing to do um, my company at the moment we are dealing with two coronavirus projects one emergency ventilators and one, a group of doctors who've got a, a labor time-saving and I think life-saving idea for the NHS. Um, nobody is being paid for that. I'm not being paid. None of my team are being paid. And that goes from writing to graphic design to website building for them. It's the right thing to do. It helps us all. And also it makes us feel better. 
I mean, these times are difficult. We feel better within ourselves if we help. So I think it's incredibly noble. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do. And I also think if you want to talk ruthless commerciality, you know, this will benefit you in the long run because there are people who are dealing with this well and there are people who are dealing with this badly. And everybody wants to work with people who are good people, reliable people, kind people. People don't want to work with those who are nasty, just too commercially minded, too ruthless. So bear in mind, keep your reputation going through this and you've built it up. People will want to stay with you and help you. So when we're at the other end, you'll still be able to continue. Not quite as though nothing had happened because nothing will ever be the same again, I think, but at least you'll be able to continue. So thank you for that. That will be appreciated. Yes. So we're still waiting for comments in terms of people reading the case study and looking. It takes a while to read that handout, doesn't it? I'm just looking at it myself. It does. And also there is a little bit of a delay between what we talk about and what we say and obviously what people see and then be react. So obviously it has to be a brief comment. What lessons are you learning? What did Tesco do well? What did BP do lamentably badly? I think from, I had a look at it and from my um, view and from what I usually would expect from a company uh, to do well, and I think just could it well, is the ownership, yeah, it, taking absolutely. the responsibility and be uh, open about, yes, we are aware this is our fault, this is our mistake, this is our thing, we accept the responsibility and we will deal with it, which I yeah. think is often the biggest mistake that you companies make, it's trying to shy away from accepting the responsibility of trying to blame someone else. Yep, very good, Lenka. You could have been a crisis communicator and a disaster manager. Absolutely spot on. Thank okay, you. should we have a look at um, the lessons learned from that so we can all see what they are? Yes, we just got a quick comment from Lillian. Denial is not the right response. People want you to be honest. So exactly yes. what we're talking about. Absolutely, yeah. And let's look at the lessons learned, bring it together. Um, Recognize the gravity and react immediately. If something bad is happening, don't stick your head in the sand. It's got to be dealt with. React immediately. Otherwise, it'll get away from you. Take ownership. It's no good trying to pass the buck like BP did. It's your problem. You deal with it. Deal with the problem is show it. Don't just deal with it. Come out and show that you're dealing with it. Look how Tesco did that. Be honest, open and transparent. As I said to you, it's important to be honest. Otherwise, you'll just get called out later. Show empathy. Em I keep going on about empathy. You, know, you think I was a nice guy, really. Um, show empathy, be sensitive and be sincere. And regular reviews and updates. Don't just let it go. Keep seeing how you're on top of it. Keep updating people about how you're getting on. Those are the lessons of um, crisis communications and disaster management, really. It's important. Do that a lot. If you do that a lot, remember what's happened with BP. You mentioned BP now. Anybody will say, oh, that golf spill, that was absolutely dreadful. Um, you mentioned um, the horse meat scandal. Most people have forgotten it. And that's down to the way it was dealt with by the respective companies. So um, you've got messaging to put together. How do you do it? Let me introduce you to what we in the comms industry call the message house. This is a very standard way of putting together a message. And this may help you with your question about you know, your new venture and why you're not getting any traction with it. This could help. This is a little bit theoretical, um, but I'll just show it to you and then I'll show you a practical application. <clears throat> the umbrella statement of the message house, the roof, that is the most critical part. Imagine to yourself, if I was talking about this issue or getting a communication out about it, what is the one single thing I would want people to remember more than anything else? That is the most important thing you put over. Below that, you get core messages and there should only be three People have limited attention spans. They can only take a certain amount in. So three core messages after that. And the foundations there at the bottom, evidence, proof points, support. So that's theory. Let me show you practice. So imagine my instance again of my company, Creative Warehouse, me as director being struck down. What would the message house look like? So the umbrella statement, the most important one, business continues as normal despite Simon's illness. If there was one thing I wanted customers and people out there who might be customers to remember, that business is continuing despite me being stricken. That's your umbrella statement. Following that, your core messages. Co-director John, who um, was much higher in the BBC than I could ever aspire to being, um, very clever, very good. He's going to run Creative Warehouse for now. Other 10 staff from places like Google, Guardian, Times, Independent are well and work on projects including websites, media training, public relations, et cetera, et cetera. That continues by video calls and meetings. Umbrella statement, we're carrying on. We're carrying on, show goes on. 
three core messages. John's going to look after things in my absence. The rest of the staff, they're still fine and doing stuff. These projects are continuing. Okay. And evidence, proof points, and support at the base there. All customers, including Downing Street, Cambridge Uni, Home Office, private companies, have been contacted. They've been told they're happy with the arrangements. Design and editorial project for university almost complete and on track because they want it done. And normal response time, one hour max. I insist on a one hour response time to anyone uh, maximum because this is a fast moving business. That remains to inquiries for support. So see how that works. Your umbrella statement, what the most important thing is to say. Under that, your core message is one, two, and three, and then evidence, proof points, and support. And if you structure your communications in that way, you tend to find you get a better response because people are brought in, they're intrigued, they're drawn into your messaging by the opening. Then you get the three after that. Oh, yeah, still quite interesting. They keep reading. If you structure it that way, you'll probably have more success with your communications. Okay. And one more thing to mention here updates. How frequently do you update? Um, you have probably all been bombarded by messages from the CEO from every blooming company you've ever had any interaction with in your life. They very quickly became tedious. They very quickly became irritated. It doesn't work. So how often um, be sparing with how you communicate by email because people get fed up with it. You might want to send out one every week or couple of weeks. Social media is different because that's fast moving and short bits. And I kind of choose to be part of it. And websites very different because I'm choosing to come to you. So you can update your website as much as you want. That's my choice to come to you. Social media, you know, not excess excess, but you can use it a bit more. Email be sparing with people are fed up with getting communications with message from the CEO. If I see one more of those, I'm going to scream. How long, how long should your updates be? Keep it short and simple. Go back to the message house. What's the most important thing? What are the three core messages? What three bits of supporting evidence can I put around that? And then stop. Because there's few things more off-putting than a great big long communication. People just move on. Keep it short and simple. The old acronym for communications, KISS. Keep it short and simple. And this is an interesting one. How do you put it? How do you communicate? What is your tone? What is your voice? We call it in the writing world. Some people are very straight and they're very dull and they're very dusty and they're really boring and they don't get much attention. My experience, the best way to communicate is with humanity and a bit of humor. We always like humor. I know this is a dreadful time. I get that. I've lost a lot of business. Friends of mine are ill. It's a desperate time. But also remember in the Second World War, part of the reason we got through it was we all kept laughing. It was a really important part of what we did. It's a symphony of our lives, humour. So humour is important as well, seeing the laughable side of things. And I just looked at some social media posts recently to give you an example of things which have worked well. This one. Your grandparents were called to war. You're being called to sit on your couch. You can do this. I know it's a dreadful situation, but let's laugh about it because laughter really, really helps us get through. Day one of quarantine diary, stocked up on enough non-perishable food supplies to last me for months, maybe years, so I can remain in isolation. Day one plus 45 minutes in the supermarket because I wanted a Twix. I'm not saying I've had that experience, but <laughs> I think many people have. And here's one from me which trended on um, LinkedIn and made a big impact. I've done a few of these um, webinars now about uh, crisis comms and coronavirus. And uh, this was the first one I did with Cambridge Network. And I genuinely was nervous. Um, I've spoken to thousands of people in various formats. And I teach all over the place and I lecture. First time I'd done a webinar, I was like, oh, I really hope this works. There are 100 people on the line twice. And I was like, ooh, about it. But it went really well. And um, just putting out that warm, humane, empathy, um, and vulnerable, really vulnerable. It's okay to share your feelings. So think about your tone. You don't want to be a robot. Nobody reacts well to a robot. People react to people. Go back to the empathy point again and again. Don't be afraid to share a bit of your heart. Okay. So um, on to the C of our ABC of crisis communications. You'll be glad to know we're nearly at the end. Cleaning up. This is one thing which is also worth mentioning. There will become an opportunity to actually get some interesting, upbeat, better news out there. So I want to introduce you to this problem, the online memory. Now, why are you looking at some fish and chips there? Why indeed? It used to be said that today's newspapers were tomorrow's fish and chip wrappers. That's changed with the online world. The online memory now means that if there's bad news about you or your company 
and people look you up on Google after this, they're going to start seeing bad news. And I use this example here because I was in Northern Ireland working with the executive a couple of months ago. I went to the Titanic Belfast, a very moving place. But now if I went to Belfast in a few months time as a tourist when all this is over, and I looked up Titanic Belfast, this is one of the first things I'll see on Google. And I might think, oh, poof, don't want to go to that. That's probably closed down or not very nice or whatever. It's a bad piece of PR. So you want to try and get some news out there, whether on social media or in conventional media, any way you want, which is much more positive and upbeat. And you have what's called the window of opportunity. And you'll know this has opened when at the moment the news is 95% dominated by coronavirus and it's all miserable. My main news bulletins of the day are six o'clock news on Radio 4 and uh, the eight o'clock bulletin on Radio 4. And at the moment, the six o'clock, which is half an hour, is 28 minutes of uh, coronavirus news followed by some story about someone dying. It's really not cheery. When that starts to peter away, so there's only about 10 minutes of coronavirus news, that's your window of opportunity opening up. Now, that's going to be a few weeks, might even be a couple of months. But that means that the media are now looking for other stories and people are talking about other things because the media just reflect what's going on out there. That means there is still an opportunity because we're thinking about coronavirus, but we're thinking about more upbeat, more positive things. So try and get some of those out there at that point and try and shift off the first page of Google the bad news, which people might find about you or your company. And things you could do, I mean, you could have a celebration of kicking the coronavirus, conquering coronavirus. You could hold a party for your customers. You could give them big discounts for sticking with you, being loyal. You can make a donation to a medical charity. Creativity is endless. There's lots of things you can think of. But if you can get some good news out there at the end of this, it will really help you and it will shift the bad news off the front of Google and it will start to look much better, look much better for you. Okay, so I'm almost finished. You'll be glad to know. Summing up, ABC of crisis, coronavirus crisis communications. A, anticipation, holding statements. Think about who you're talking to, who might be there to talk to them um, and how you do it. Uh, boom, recognize and react, own and act. Um, so BP versus Tesco, you know, all the lessons are in there. And cleaning up online memory the window of opportunity i'm going to say one final thing um, before we have some questions and this i suppose is if you like the golden rule and see i put it in yellow these things aren't just thrown together the golden rule of dealing with crises and crisis communications the golden rule is this hope for the best but and the example i'm going to show you is from 50 years ago and one of the most extraordinary feats that humanity has ever managed and I'm going to show you this now. Just read it for a few seconds. And then we'll talk about why I showed it to you. So just have a look at this. So there you go. Um, the moon landing was an extraordinary feat. But throughout that remarkable journey, we never really knew if it was going to work or not. Big stakes, big risk. Hope for the best. Let's hope it works out. And thankfully, we know it did. But prepare for the worst. So that was a speech which was written for Nixon, who's president at the time, just in case um, the two astronauts got to the moon and something went wrong and they weren't coming back. And that's crisis communications and dealing with crisis. Hope for the best, yes. But don't rely on it. Prepare for the worst. And one final thing to mention about that, although that was an extraordinary feat to get man to the moon in under 10 years since Kennedy issued the challenge to his country, it was an enormous challenge, but in the end, we got through it. It worked out. It was a success. This, what we're facing at the moment, is also an enormous challenge, but I also do believe in human spirit. I believe in empathy. I've mentioned it a few times. I believe in ingenuity. I believe we can come through it. So although we're preparing for the worst, I think there are better days ahead. So I hope you take that with you. I hope that was helpful. And if you've got any questions, assuming my internet sticks with it, then I'm very happy to answer them now. Uh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. We got a couple of comments. Olina said in uh, reply to your advice about how to communicate she said, true, I appreciate companies that only send a couple of short emails only when there were news and updates. So just get to the point, give me the update. But obviously, I don't need a massive long letter of heartfelt feelings and fluffiness from everyone. Uh, Ella said, this is all such useful insights. Thank you. You're helping me to see the bigger picture. 
and uh, we have more positive feedback. We have what an insightful session. Many thanks for sharing. I can't see any questions just yet. So please, if you have any questions, if just anything that you would like to check in with Simon, you would like an advice, if there's any practical examples or anything you would like to see, please do let us know we have Simon for a couple more minutes. Um, but there's more lovely thank yous coming from uh, Pamela and Ali and Kelly. Thank you all so much for joining. I just want to thank see so many of you who are joining us for this lunchtime session. Uh, someone has already asked about a recording. Yes, this video will be available in the Facebook group for replay, but we will also be uploading, uploading the video with Simon's handout and his slides to our Cambridge social media website into the resource page. So if you, if someone is watching this and you're not on Facebook, that's absolutely fine. You can still watch it. And um, before we get any questions, if we get any questions, I would like to tell you about our upcoming event. So we will, we're trying to do something like this once or twice a week. And next week on Monday, we have Chrissy Buck, uh, who you might remember from Cambridge Social Media Day last year, she represented Quick, and she decided to set her own venture this year and Digital Neighborhood. And she will be talking next week about her four C's for community building. So she will help you understand how in this crisis you can actually build and grow a community, nurture a community and use the community management on social media to grow your business after the situation. And on Friday, Thursday or Friday, I will double check the date. We have our um, community manager, Tana, talking about social listening. So she will help you understand the tools and she will help you use them and use this time again for social listening to see what brands and companies and people are saying about your company and how you can potentially as someone said plan some good news to balance if there's something negative happening out there but i can't see any more questions coming so i will expect that everyone was absolutely blown away and has all they need from your session simon so I will just say a huge thank you. And if there's anything else, if you have a closing remarks, please go ahead. No, only say thank you for listening. Um, I do genuinely believe we will get through this. Um, and don't forget to communicate. You'll be amazed. I have seen wonderful examples of people looking after each other through this. Um, maybe that's one of the bright sides that will come out of it. I know many of you will work very, very hard to build up a business with lots of customers. You'll have put heart and soul into it. I do believe that they want to help you through this. So communicate with them, keep them on side, and that might just uh, help you get through this all right. And in the meantime, if I can help with anything, my contact details are there. Good luck, good luck getting through this. And I look forward to seeing you in person when we're finally allowed to actually socialize again. What a day that will be. Look forward to that. And thank you for inviting me, Link. Thank you so much, Simon. And yes, exactly as Simon said, if you have any further questions, do leave them in the comments, do reach out to us directly, or reach out to Simon and we will get back to you as soon as we can. And, oh, we have one question. So quickly before I hit stop recording, we have Sadie, how do you think life and business will change once all this is blown over? Do you think it will be business as usual or do you think there will be a shift in attitudes and approach? I think small businesses have been the savior in this situation. That's a very big question. I think there will be a shift. Um, I think um, many bosses only think that people work when they can see them. And I think there'll be much more homeworking. And I think that will be good for us as a community with less commuting, less pollution, less blight on our cities. I mean, most of us know and live around Cambridge. The beautiful city is so blighted by these massive traffic jams. You can't get anywhere. I hope there's less of that. I hope there's more sense of community. People realise that you can talk to your neighbours and you can actually get on and you can do wonderful things together. I hope that will help us. I hope we can come out stronger. Um, but yeah, it's been a hell of an experience to try and get there. So, yeah, I think it will have benefits in the long run, but it's certainly a painful regime to get there. Yeah. I think you said it perfectly. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Simon, for sharing your insightful knowledge. And yes, see you all on the other side and hopefully see you all very shortly in person. Look forward Bye. to that. Bye. Bye.